Is y'all ready? For Mr. ZZ Jasper. Came all the way from Detroit, Michigan. And um, I'm just gonna read his bio real quick, tell y'all a little information in his little business. <laughs> so we should say, but Azizi Jasper, author, community organizer, and cultural advocate. Azizi Jasper is a d dynamic performer and a passionate advocate for social justice. He has shared the stage alongside influencers, including rapper, actor, Common, the great poet, Gil Scott Heron, Grammy winning Marvin Sapp, Detroit Super Group, Slum Village, renowned poet Saul Williams, and Minister Louis Farrakhan, to name a few. These presentations are lively, powerful, and thought provoking. Jasper gave a keynote at the Grand Rapids Rosa Parks statue dedication, as well as dedicating a poem to Detroit Super Producer Jay Dilla's mother during the fifth annual Dilla Day at the Fillmore. Jasper has been featured alongside current and former Grand Rapids poet laureates in the acclaimed compilation Song of the <laughs> on Washington, I might have pronounced that wrong. I think it's Indian. Or Cherokee or something. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's available on Amazon. He is the founder of several open mics in his native Grand Rapids and has adopted city of Detroit, including the longest running spoken word open mic in West Michigan, smoking spoken word, as well as the Neo, Gra Neo Grail, Open Mic and Nardi's Knowledge Cafe. Azizi also works as a political organizer, having assistant on more than 30 regional campaigns and was director of Detroit area, get out the vote for the Michigan Democratic Party. For more information about Azizi, follow his Facebook fan page, Poet Azizi Hassani Jasper. So give it up for Mr. Azizi Jasper, you guys. Please, please, please. How's everybody feeling? Yeah. Thank you, brother, for that, uh, that song, man. That was perfect. He was talking earlier. He was like, what you want to call? I'm like, man, you pick it, man. You pick it. You got it. So, yeah, that was, that was dope. That was dope. Um, thank you uh, for coming out. This is, this is beautiful. This is, uh, this is incredible. So, um, as uh, Kamasi was saying, I am uh, native to Grand Rapids, but I moved to Detroit like six years or so ago. Um, so, you know, I travel across, uh, uh, across the state uh, often, but it's always good to come um, back to the west side and be close to, you know, where I really consider uh, to be home. So, um, just a couple, of, uh, a couple of ground rules, you know, real quick. We had an amazing open mic, uh, so much talent. Um, can we give all the artists that, uh, that perform? <laughs> Definitely. Um, so as he was saying, like the, the, the energy that you give out there is replicated by whatever is happening up here, right? So I know I speak for my, my brother uh, Moody, he's go, who's, gonna, uh, who's gonna come up after myself. Uh, when I say like, give us your energy. If we say something that you like, let us know. Even if we say something that you might not like, still let us know. We want it to be an honest exchange of energy, and I promise you, the more you give, the more we give. Uh, I'm going to read uh, a little something uh, from a book uh, that I was uh, published in with a couple of um, different uh, poet laureates from the, the West Michigan area. Um, Song of a Washtenag, I believe it's pronounced. Um, <laughs> and uh, Right, 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 yeah. No, he was, he came over to me uh, like a second ago, like, yo, how you pronounce that? I'm like, bros, okay. Um, so check it out. <clears throat> it's called Generalizations of a Generation via Future Hindsight if we don't save it. My generation was filled with rebels whose only cause was rebellion. So so many causes went neglected and they fell into oblivion and opinionated people with miseducated opinions a domesticated people convinced they had no dominion. My, my generation was filled with men and women that sought the truth with their eyes closed. Fishing for religion in waters too shallow for God to flow, yet it was deep enough for my generation to drown in. My generation was filled with politicians that manipulated politics. Capitalists that participated in politics, so my generation was filled with politicians that were capitalist. My, gener my generation's politics were capitalism. My generation occupied 
Wall Street. But, but my generation also occupied Walmart. And those that occupied failed to laser in on one single problem, so the beam did not remove my generation's tumors, it only shed light. My generation destroyed the environment. Then my generation became environmentalist. My generation hated poverty, but my generation was disproportionately poor. My generation hated poverty, but not as much as it, as it hated its poor, because my generation kept its poor impoverished. My generation allowed Dr. King's legacy to be summed up in five minutes worth of sound bites. My generation allowed a 500 year struggle to be summed up as Dr. King's legacy. My generation was full of social networkers, but, but my generation was socially awkward. My generation was on the computer all the time, but my generation was still overwhelmingly illiterate. My generation fought to use the word nigger. My generation was ignorant. My generation didn't take care of its kids. My generation were kids when they had kids. My generation called its woman a, my generation was filled with a bunch of, my generation called its woman out of her name. My generation was filled with a bunch of numbers, no names. My generation neglected its sisters. My generation feared its brothers. My generation locked its brothers in its prisons. My generation made prison an industry. Thus, my generation gave those that filled its prisons an incentive. My generation was gay, but my generation was homophobic. And those that were born gay felt exploited because some were acting and performing, and they blamed it on the down low when they said it was a phase, while those who died simply, be, simply to be who they really were were rolling in their graves. My, my generation had a fear of countries that never attacked us. My generation caused turmoil. My generation backed rebels without a cause. My generation's cause was oil. My generation raped Palestine. My generation didn't see it on TV, so my generation did not know because my generation didn't read. My generation overthrew Mubarak and they killed Gaddafi and they met it in the Middle East and Egypt and Libya and Palestine and Syria became more violent than my generation had ever seen. My generation's music was digital, even when it was acoustic. My generation's cameras were excessive, but its talent was elusive. My generation thought that TV was reality. My generation lived vicariously. My generation was cellular. My generation cloned its meat. My generation gave dogs and cats immunity, but, but swine and cows were better known as pork and beef. My generation gave itself cancer. My generation damaged its health. My generation made healthcare expensive. My generation equated life with wealth. My generation was pregnant with potential. My generation aborted itself. Generalizations of a generation via future hindsight. I feel so good. That's so good. Yo. So I read these rhymes for those that don't read the times. But instead, in between the lines, like incarcerated hands, I'm talking about, about brothers and sisters with the, the mental potential to stencil with pencil with mere mortal minds only dream of. I mean those that don't bleed blood, but, but instead ink with the power to make a million fools think, the power to make the unconscious wake, the power to make suicide commit life. For them, this rhyme I write. For kings so ahead of the time, the words are often deemed prophetic, and, and queens so powerful they can turn a potential king kinetic with their rhetoric. Those whose lyrical miracles made old Negroes spiritual, made young Negroes militant, made unfocused Negroes diligent with the pen. This rhyme is for them who, who carry on the written tradition. Those that make their dreams a reality because nothing is fiction. Those that understand that living is really just dying, so nothing's really a contradiction, but through their words they shall forever live, so they, they write with conviction, so they have something to live for, and so that they have something to die for, and, and since the revolution will not be televised, our seeds have something to strive toward. This rhyme is for them, for, for you, for her, for, for him, for women, children, and men, for all of those that write their rhymes with their right hand like me. 
to see with my right hand I write plans to right wrongs of lifespans that bring life like midwives on desolate islands with, with my glasses on my nightstand. I'm, I'm squinting to write. I'm feeling like Malcolm in prison as he studied at night. You see the twilight, it glistens, the still at night listens. The words I recite as I scribe my pen are less similar to English than they are hieroglyphics. These vague thoughts are fools of a scholar specifics. Our, our women's statistics are mingled convicted. Our children alone in the cycles consistent of my masochistic or is this world twisted? My elders won't speak and my children won't listen. I said I got a hard time believing that this here is, is part of God's plan, yet and still with my, with my right hand I write plans to right wrongs of lifespans that bring life like midwives on desolate islands and with my glasses on my nightstand I'm still squinting to write. I got the mood and moaning, moon is floating, incense burning, eyes are closing, mind is open. Guns are smoking, lungs are choking, rhymes are written already, wrote them, raise your focus. Save the culture, fakes and vultures, jakes and jesters, haters, hecklers, they disrespected us. Disconnected, distant lovers, mistress mayhem, unwed mothers, end of summer. It's somewhat sacred, grass is greener, minds is grayish, ill demeanor, pound the pavement. The pen, the pad, insomniac, cognac, I'm back to black and blue, we're back to basics. We trace the truth, the wisdom youth, to live aloof in land of ham and swine and bacon. The time for truth to rise above the lies, but no one believes because the truth is ostentatious and outrageous. Strange as fruit is, dangling, strangling life. That's why our struggle's sacred. From blacks on blocks that slang the rocks to Iraqis with rocks that slang them rocks at cops and tanks. It's, it's all the same sh off the slave ship, on the spaceship, all the same. Where songbirds sing sonnets, saturating silence with sonic sustenance, and, and sober sequences seep silently between sound waves and sorrow. And summer sunshine swallows other stars while squinting eyes stare steadfastly seeking something. Scenery is sultry as a southern sister slowly sees in stride, surpasses even the Sabbath in its sanctity, be it celebrated on Saturday or Sunday, it seems like somewhat the same scenario. Still, shouldering stresses with the strength of stone statues, all the while studying stories as astutely as to not succumb to those. Selling stupidity subliminally, setting sun strategically like swords swung by Sung Su, seamlessly slicing the sanctity of a seamlessly sane society, socialized by Satan to succumb or starve. So what, some smart someone said, echoing the sound of the sidewalk. So much sorrow in these socially constructed slums of ours, but still, songbirds, they sing sonnets, saturating silence with sonic sustenance, while sober sequences seep silently between sound waves and sorrow. Thank you. Yo. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Yo, this feels good, man. This feels good up here. Everybody like that? We're good. We're good. That's what's up. Beautiful. Um, do a couple, couple more pieces. I'm gonna get out your, uh, your hair, man. I'm really excited to hear my brother, uh, Moody Black, man. He's, he's. Yeah, no, I man. I'm, yeah. This is we exchange of energy here, man. It's, it's, it's all beautiful. Um, anybody, uh, if anybody ever you know, ventures over to Detroit for whatever reason, on accident or on purpose. Um, holler at me. Uh, I have a hey, open mic that I host every Thursday, every Thursday at a beautiful spot called 90s Knowledge Cafe. Um, it is a black-owned oasis in the middle of Highland Park. It's like dab smack. It's dab smack in the middle of the hood, right? In the neighborhood. Let's keep the neighbor in the hood, right? It's dab smack in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, it's in a, in a really crazy part of Highland Park, but it's an oasis. It's a uh, black-owned um, art gallery, museum, and bookstore. Um, and we host like the dopest open mic ever, except for the, the spot, uh, except for the hideout and shit. I say the hideout, we host the dopest open mic ever. So, yes sir, yes sir. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's a, uh, it's a really dope set, man. So um, if you guys are ever free on a Thursday night uh, from 9.30 until, uh, we go till about uh, 1.30, 2 o'clock. Um, yeah, every Friday morning, man, I, I come into work looking like Forrest Whitaker, man. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, so I'm, I'm going to do a, a couple of other pieces. I do have, uh, I do have uh, CDs for sale. I'm going to sell my CDs for whatever Moody's selling his CDs for because I'm not going to undercut the brother. But do know that my presentation is like terrible, right? So, but CDs are really about what's, what's, what's on them, right? It's not really about... <laughs> I promise you, I promise you, <laughs> if you buy this, Along, along with, along with my, with my brother uh, Moody's, Moody CD, you gonna get like a really dope CD. You're not gonna get any. I'm not gonna waste your time with liner notes. I'm not gonna leave you with any inspirational message. Nothing like that. No, no cover art to distract you with. It's just you and the music at that point. So, <laughs> that's what's up. Bear with me, man. I'm a work in progress. All right. So look. <clears throat> um. It shouldn't take 16 bars to raise one, like the prison bars of caged men, that disproportionately target the same men that the slave trade did. I love, I love writing, but I hate rappers. It's so redundant, their rhetoric. I'm a, I'm a throwback like the boom bappers on Cedar and Sedwick. I wrote, I wrote the rubric. She was feeling that one. <laughs> I wrote the rubric to bend the Rubik's. And then they blackmailed us. They stole our blueprint. They tried to blackball our black, what's a blackball to a cue stick? A lot of nada or nothing. Free Mamiya, I said stop front and give Asada and all my soldiers asylum up in this. Legend, man, no myth. Prophetic, my hieroglyphics. The Romans retold our story. Papyrus, and Mount Olympus. Definitive allegory. Insanity at the sickest. My skull is my stories. Cover no wonder ours is the thickest. Coming through all the thicket. These bulls, these counter-revolutionaries have buried us in the trenches. Truth is stranger than fiction. Never no need for pausing. Dead poets and rappers are only skeletons in my closet. Sometimes I rhyme slow. Sometimes I rhyme quick. Sometimes I don't rhyme at all. And because you can't put me in a category, you call me a poet, and hey, I don't mind at all. Because I write like what Richard Wright would write in hindsight, giving sight to the blind, right? And then the, then the beat breaks, I'm paving streetscapes with my soundscapes with the fluidity of Great Lakes. You see, it was almost eerie being all the way up in Ontario and hearing him say that this poem from Michigan was superior. <laughs> I said, sometimes I rhyme slow. Sometimes I rhyme quick. Sometimes I don't rhyme at all. And because you cannot put me inside a category, you call me a poet, and A, I don't mind at all, because I write like what Richard Wright would write in hindsight, giving sight to the blind, right? And, and then the beat breaks, I'm paving streetscapes with my soundscapes with the fluidity of Great Lakes. I said it was almost eerie being all the way up in Ontario and hearing them say that this poet from Michigan was superior. They called me arrogant and said that I was full of myself because my afro made the big wigs feel inferior. A hipster, hardly more of a mixture of Medgar, Garvey, Kwame, Mumia, Tupac, Marley. A revolutionary may be more of a revolutionary's baby. I'm merely an apple, and from the tree I don't fall far from thee. Either I'm reading or I'm writing at rest of the work reciting. I try to write twice every day like broke clocks. <laughs> I'm writing the final resolution and the leave it at people's confusion because if I spark the revolution right now, sadly, most of you would only watch. 
You see, our melanin's been diluted, our mindset's been convoluted. You might like my status, but you wouldn't throw a rock. Got the biggest stage in the city with more ears than ever, and misogyny and death and bulls is all we can think of to talk. New slaves indeed, the circles are right around us, the comforts of the earth until it resembles Saturn. I'm, I'm, feeling, like black Matt, I'm feeling like black Moses, Miss Tubman with the musket. Anybody can get it, I'll never count to grab it. While, while you praying to somebody, I'm praying to God body. I pray to my ancestors while savages call it magic. Only speaking in relevance, the average person's intelligence is well below average, and that's, that's tragic. I freed a thousand slaves in this here underground railroad. I, I lost not one of them on the way. I freed a thousand slaves, but I could have freed a thousand more if they only knew that they were slaves. It is not your story. It is our story. And until we can tell the story of what happened to us, there'll be no story except for the month with 28 days. There's 28 ways to keep my story out of the pages of his storybooks. So history looks so inaccurate, textbooks inadequate, 28 days is 28 ways. As long as we allow him to tell it, then we'll, we'll forever be slaves to whatever he says, leaving my story a mystery in time. As long as we allow him to write our storybooks, then his story, his story, his storybooks will forever be lies. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate it. My name is Azizu Osama Jasper. Connect with me, Facebook, my social media. Let's talk afterwards as well. Appreciate y'all so much. Much love. Peace. That's the hard on floor right there. <laughs> Man, um, did y'all like that? Yeah. yeah I see y'all all over the world. Man. Appreciate you, brother. Like you said, he got CDs. It's not the presentation. It's the art that's on the disc. But, um, whew, man, hold on, I gotta catch myself real quick, man. <laughs> Next, we have Mr. Moody Black, came all the way from Greensville. Did I say that right? Yep, Greensville, I'm sorry, South Carolina, y'all. So I'm gonna tell y'all about Mr. Moody Black, y'all. Hmm, <laughs> See, you got this poster over there. I'm going to bring it up here, though, when you get ready to spit. Yeah, you got it in the corner. I'm going to bring it up here, though. But, um, okay, Mr. Moody Black has been a performing artist since the age of 12 and has become a prominent vo force on a multi-regional poetry scene through his enthusiastic live shows and work ethnic. Moody Black has created buzz in the following impressive achievements. Host of one of the longest running open mics in South Carolina and National Poetry Awards in 2015 for best open mic venue in the nation. The Say What Open Mic in Greensville, South Carolina. National Poetry Awards 2015, best host of an open mic venue. Poetry Slam coach and Slam master. Small arts teaching artist, making words move. Beard and sock model, motivational speaker and comedian. 2017 Gas with Best Poet in the Nation Award. One of the artists that opened up for Trey Songs at the Carolina First Center in Greensville, South Carolina. Grind Flu Magazine Poet of the Year for the second time. Nominated for Album of the Year and received Legend Award from Indy Fire Radio. He loves sweet potato pie and waterfalls. Entrepreneur of natural hair and beer products. I need that beer product. <laughs> and for more information about Moody Black, Please check out his website, IamMoodyBlack.com. And this brother is just not a poet. Like I said, he's a smart arts teacher where he travels and he goes to different schools and universities and co at the college level, elementary, high school level, where he teaches kids poetry. And they incorporate that poetry into the English curriculum for that school district. So that's give it up for Mr. Moody Black, y'all. Lord, it's so hard living this life. 
A constant struggle each and every day. Many are blind and cannot find the truth cause no one seems to really know. But I won't accept this is how it's going to be. Devil, you got to let me and my people go. Because I want to be free, completely free. I won't let this world weary me. My daughter once told me that every night when she go to bed, she sleep with a small picture of her little brother right beside her pillow at night before she go to bed. My daughter loves her little brother. Both, born from different mothers, never taught my kids about being half siblings. One of my elders once told me that God only make people whole. But funny, when I think back in history class, textbooks say we were once considered three-fifths. But on July 9th, was supposed to be a day of hanging downtown with daddy, I, along with my eight-year-old daughter and my four-year-old son at the time, found ourselves in the midst of a march. Folk marching over the deaths of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, so we marching. My son, face filled with four-year-old aggression. Huey Newton, in his spirit, he felt the energy of the crowd, and he screamed, Black Lives Matter, screamed like a steam engine from his four-year-old teeth. His older sister reached for his left hand to make sure he was safe as we marched with Sir Jonah Truth and her eye, close eye on his every step. She turned around and she asked, she said, Daddy, how come we marching? So I explained her by asking, if your brother and I were to do anything wrong and a police officer kill us only because of our color, would that make you mad and sad? And she said, yeah. So I told her that these people are marching because they don't know what else to do. And they want to show the world that they're mad and sad. Y'all, deep down, I was mad and sad because black folks still marching. So immediately, my mind flashed. 10 years from now, seeing him still marching. My son faced filled with 14-year-old aggression. Huey Newton still in the spirit. My daughter, she's 18 years old, still watching her brother every step, both of their fists pumping, screaming for the justice of the murder of their father. My mind flashed 10 more years, seeing my 28-year-old daughter still marching, holding a picture of her little brother, that same picture, she's laid beside her pillow at night. No, she never see him again. She's screaming and crying to Niagara Falls, fall on her face, screaming to her voice became Silent Black Lives Matter. My, my mind's still flashing. 10 years from now, she's 38 years old. My daughter still marching on the picture of her husband, on the picture of her son, on the picture of her father, on the picture of her brother. Hoping y'all get the picture. I'm hoping y'all get the picture every week somewhere. Somebody has a father, has a brother. Somebody right now get a daughter going to bed with a small picture of their little brother lying right beside their pillow at night. No, they never seen him again. We are mad and sad and refuse to be broken. How can we keep being reduced to being a fraction of what we're supposed to be? How come black folks are still marching? How come the police trying to three-fifths our freedom? We are mad and sad, refuse to be broken. We've been marching since 1942. We are tired, and our shoes ain't got no more souls to give. You must have heard us out here right now. Look at my ears, but you're not here. 
Man, I, I'm, I'm so ecstatic with the energy. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. Give yourselves a hand. My brother, Aziz, oh my God, bro. Oh my God. It's been some years, and it's a, the building poets is again, the energy man and poets, man, when you really got a real poetry community, when you got poets that's really true to who they are, it's always beautiful when we get together and we inspire each other. I'm sitting like, oh my God, ah! <laughs> so it's beautiful, it's beautiful. Um, bro, thank you for sharing your story, man. That is beautiful, man. Thank you so much. It takes a lot to open up, to give yourself. It's why we do what we do is healing. It's definitely healing. Uh, excuse the bags under my eyes. I drove straight here from South Carolina. And I wasn't going to miss it for the world. Nah, I wasn't going to miss this. So, um, Moody Black, I'm a storyteller, I'm a poet, comedian, actor, and uh, all sorts of things. Uh, yeah, so I have stories to stay alone with the theme. How many of you? Uh, Still have your grandparents alive. Any grandparents alive? Awesome, awesome. Listen, I've been on this kick this whole year. Give people their flowers while they're still here. I don't care who it is. Tell somebody how great they are, man. Brother, you are wonderful. Brother, you are great putting this together, man. You all are awesome, man. Tell people now. My grandma, my last grandparent died 12 years ago. Uh, my grandmother, it was interesting, you don't discover who they really are until they're gone. My granny, my granny was four foot 11. With gray hair and gray eyes to match, and for the most part, she was a quiet woman. Woven and sunk deep in a shabby recline, and she was kind of anybody with a smile. That's why I was a favorite grandson. Because I always made her laugh. Yet, she was always quiet. Now, it is sad that the quiet ones are the ones you got to look out for. Because in my adolescence, as I got older, I tried to get over that like I know the game. But during the summertime, when we were out of school, Mama had to work. We had to stay with Granny. Now, all the great TV shows came on at 11 a.m., but my Granny would wait to watch <sighs> The Price is Right. I hated Bob Barker. Because what I was telling we had it all, we wanted to stay there, cartoons or something, anything but the price is right now. It seemed like my granny was asleep. <laughs> but it seemed like the clock screamed 11 a.m. Because my granny say this right here. She said, baby, it's time for the price is right. We thought she was taking a nap. But my granny would say, every closed eye ain't sleep. I was young, but I knew that was deep. Now fast forward, all her grandbabies got grown with high levels of education, what some of you may consider a good job, but all of us with our good jobs had to borrow money from granny from time to time. And when we needed that loan, she would push herself up from that shabby recliner and with a pigeon-toed stride, she would creep to a room to the hiding place where she placed her savings. Now, the only payment plan we had was to come by every now and then and smile with her. And when I didn't have a place to stay, y'all, she said I can always live with her until I get on my feet. Fast forward, I got on my feet, got my own place to stay. But soon after, Granny was placed in a nursing home. It didn't feel the same. I didn't feel the same. Because folk don't know that she's seen 33,945 moons. 
and pray twice as many amens to the hallelujah the son to she seen grands, great grands and great great grands and she never finished high school or college but she acquired a knowledge from the school of hard knocks with the major in making sure them babies eat and a minor and making ends meet but I never wanted to meet the day that she met her destiny. My mama said she was mad because I didn't cry at my grandfather's funeral. So I know she mad because I didn't cry at my grandmother's funeral either. But to keep my sanity, the man in me had to be strong for everyone else. And this poem itself can express how I felt. And I wish my family knew how I felt. That every time I got rid of every symbol of a memory, every heirloom, even the old peach crate that left outside for the garbage men to collect, I got. And it risked my heart and my soul cries tears. Now I feel like wishing well from around the world because she, she was the world to me. My granny was a poet. I didn't know it till she died, but I did remember that when she spoke, it was parables and poetries and philosophy that day, and she was speaking prophecy when I was little, watching the prices right. Because she was letting us know that she'll always watch over us. Because every closed eye ain't sleep. Thank you. I promise I'm not stripping. I'm not stripping. That's my third shift job. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'll do a second shift. Anyway, uh, how many parents out here? How many parents? Parents? Oh, hey, yeah, y'all here. I can't believe the parents. I'm about to put you on some game, so all my poems won't be all, we're going to have some fun, it won't be all dark, so I'm going to laugh with you for a little bit. So I'm going to put you on some game. You can't tell your children, okay? <laughs> if you have not already done this, start doing this. Reward yourself with a car meal. I know you're thinking, what's a car meal, Moody? I'm glad you ask. I'm going to tell you, dog. So <laughs> when your children are already at home and then they're eating everything, you don't got out of work, and all you got is five dollars your name, but you want to get something for just yourself, and you go buy yourself a combo somewhere, and you park in front of the house, but you eat your meal in the car. <laughs> That's a car meal. You don't eat like this, you know. You look around. <laughs> you don't even look at it. <laughs> But you gotta, I gotta make sure you eat this for the kids out here. And if the kids find somebody get hip to your game, Mama, what you wanna do? My train say, Mama, go on, say, we're going now. Go kick it out. Now come on. I was all big game. I said, go get it. Kids come by with boxes of wrappers in the car. <laughs> so treat yourself to a car meal. You have a car date one day with you, you and your special lover just eating the car. Don't tell the kids. We ain't got no for everybody. <laughs> it's me and your baby. Oh, I have just a dog dog bus, little babies. You got little babies in the car. <laughs> Gotta hurry up when they come home. <laughs> but, uh, Fair parents, beautiful. Make sure you, 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 you talk to your kids, have conversations about what's going on in the world. Um, especially, man, I, if any single parent, man, my heart goes out to you. You know, I know it's, you got to do two parents' jobs, man, but, you know, all you can do is all you can do. And show your kids you love them. You'll be all right, I promise you. All she ever wanted was a little piece of happiness. That same little piece of happiness that show up TV and movies, that same little piece of happiness that show up in commercials where everyone seemed to be in bliss. That kind of happiness was a product she just couldn't afford. No coupon, no half-off sale, no tax-free weekend, no layaway. That kind of happiness eluded her. Raising three teenagers on her own where each father didn't bother, but she was constantly bothered by bill collectors. A good man seemed like a myth. In hard times was an old friend who always had a place to sit. Her children did food and their clothes didn't seem to fit. Oh, she had a job, but there's more going out 
to coming in. Ironically, the only thing she was happy was going in to that building called church. She'd wake up every morning with her head up high, walk into those doors with a dress she got at, the one price though, but she looked nice though. <laughs> and she knows the goodwill will come because everybody at her church made it feel welcome because her church was a refuge for the have-nots to have happiness. So when that collection plate got passed to give the last that you had, she would sprinkle Monday through Saturday in the form of nickels and dimes in that collection plate to relieve her of that depressive state. She would close her eyes and cry that single, I can't take it no more tear. And she whispered, here God, take all I got so I can be happy. Make all of my hallelujahs make sense and make a sense and even though to her, all the words in the Holy Bible didn't quite make sense. But at that moment, she stood up with no care or concern of being judged. She stretched her arms to the heavens like she was opening up the pearly gates. She started jumping and spinning and screaming out, dear God. But she simply said, thank you. For she was thankful for the opportunity to breathe. Because what she felt, you don't see it in TVs or movies, what she felt, there's no need for a coupon, tax-free weekend, or a layaway, because what she felt can only be described by a man. Amen. Amen. And after church, you realize what you're going through. Everybody's going through it and through it all. You know, somebody's big mama got your plate. Especially when you put all you got inside of a plate. Especially when all you're trying to do is save a little taste of a little peace to get a little peace. Because a little piece of happiness was on the day called Sunday. So, shameless plug, I, so I have CDs. Uh, I, I do have the little cover art, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, mean, it's all, <laughs> I felt bad, like, oh man, I got cover art. <laughs> but I mean, it's got some dope stuff on it. It's, you know, it's got some great poems, music behind it, and stuff like that. Uh, it's called The Uncovering Part Two, and this is uh, this series, I'm going a little deeper, revealing stuff about myself. So, uh, yeah, it's just $10. Only $10. There we go. It's almost free. But, uh, yeah, uh, send me back to South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> Gaslight is on. Uh, yeah, it's a funny thing, parking with the gaslight on. I got you. I see I get home. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, it's, it's you know, support a brother. I do have wristbands that say, see me shine, you know, because even through your darkest hour, if you give your best, somebody's going to see you shining. So, yeah, so... But you know, so, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, for the story, for the story, no, I, I get, out, get out your hair, I got one more poem. But uh, yeah, so I got my son, he, he was four at the time when I did the poem. And that first poem is actually a true story. Like, we got caught in the middle of a march, man, and it gave me an opportunity to have dialogue with my children about what's going on. But uh, he's seven now, but he's always been infatuated with pirates. Don't get that. But I love pirates. So we went to the grocery store one day. He loves sitting in the buggy, even though he's grown now. Kicking his legs, singing his little happy songs. So I'm, I'm, I'm pushing the, the, the buggy down the frozen food aisle. And I don't know where I can, this six foot three guy, this Caucasian gentleman with long, stringy black hair and an eye patch. That's what I said. So I'm pushing the buggy, trying to make some life decisions. Fortunately, my son had his back to him at that moment in time. But the guy made it his business to stop and speak to my child. Hey, son. And my son's eyes grew big like 50 cent pieces. And he saw this guy, this six foot three white guy with black stringy hair and eye patch. And he just could have burst outside his body. He turned to me and pointed at the guy. And he said, Dad, it's a pirate! Arr! 
Say so he got a battery in his in his back. <laughs> he did not stop with the arg, arg, putting in the guy's face. Oh, to the guy, the guy that finished so walk away. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. He was like, oh, it's okay. I get it all the time. Then why you do that to my son? Then why? That's what I said in my head, man. Eh? <laughs> He was six foot tall, y'all. I'm five, I'm five nine. I had to make some decisions, you know. So. I, I, I didn't even forget what I was supposed to be getting in that aisle. I was trying to get my son out of the store. He <laughs> out of the store. <laughs> you know, he had to keep moving, keep moving. But I always really talk about kids while I do my comedy. My kids are funny. Now, if you're from the hood or the neighborhood, if you have neighbors in your hood, <laughs> you do have some of them. You know what I'm You know, I'm from the side, but I ain't completely slow. I'm like, you know, learn me so. But the world, world called Kool Aid by its flavor. We call Kool Aid by its color. <laughs> and tell me, man, hurt friends is okay. I'm going to learn you something today. If you say to give me some strawberry lemon fruit punch or <laughs> cherry, you ask it for red Kool Aid. <laughs> and you're never surprised what you get. <laughs> it's going to be red. <laughs> you come over there, have scissors in the hand, you say, give me some cherry. All right. <laughs> we may have just watermelon. It's going to be red. <laughs> but I tried to get bougie one time. Try to teach my kids better. Get y'all out this hood mentality. We're going to call Kool Aid. <laughs> By his rightful name. <laughs> In this house. <laughs> so, <laughs> my man got to the floor. Like <laughs> so I was like, I'm trying to be a good father. Try to teach my kids better. So I had a picture of grape Kool Aid I was making. Now, my older, I have an older daughter. She's grown now. By the time she was six, and she's, oh, daddy, you making some purple Kool-Aid. And me and my bougie tail tried to correct her. No, child. That is grape Kool-Aid. And she looked at me. They look at the picture. Scratched their head like I said something wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong. <laughs> no, daddy, that's purple. And I you know. <laughs> I don't get outwitted by a six-year-old <laughs> when I know I'm right. <laughs> uh, baby, I said that's great, man. That's great. And she, <laughs> and her head like, why are they trying to change up now? <laughs> uh, daddy, it's purple. And she was cool. I lost my cool. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. You know you in the hood like that. No, no, no. That cool you start talking the syllables. That cool is great. <laughs> Like I'm doing hot cold in the house, bro. That cold in the It was great. And she was cool. I'm smart. She's like, no, daddy, but it's purple. I had to catch myself because for five minutes I was arguing with a six year old. The moral of that, y'all, watch out for pirates and don't argue with six year olds. There you go. All right, so. I try not to leave people with dark poems because I, I was preparing for this story situation. Now, I do have a lot of poems where I would be performing uh, at the hideout. <laughs> so when you hear my other stuff, come support this brother's venue, and you get to see and hear my other stuff. There you go. You get to he, have, have more laughs. Yeah, you can clap for you. can clap. Clap for free. There you go. <clears throat> All right, so last poem. Um, so yeah, this particular poem, I, I did at a workshop, I do workshops, and this workshop was for adults, and I challenged my participants to get a popular song at the time, 
get the chorus of the song, but write a poem to that, totally different what the song talk about. I'm like, okay, let's get into it. And, you know, I'm always walking around, just observing. And one of the participants was like, uh, uh, Moody, uh, why are you not going to do this? And I was like, well, I'm the facilitator. And everybody's head went up. <laughs> you know, so I was forced <laughs> to write a poem. But good thing I did. Uh, the poem uh, actually got a lot of national and global attention. Uh, even made the... Uh, all Deaf Poetry, which is an offshoot brand from Russell Simmons' Deaf Poetry Jam. Uh, it was selected through their company, the poem I performed at a national competition. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to share this poem with you all because it tells a great story, uh, especially pertaining to the African diaspora. And, uh, yeah, here we go. Oh, bless my kids by putting their coat on the floor. <laughs> my child here now. Daddy, your coat on the floor, Daddy. Whips all of my back, no shoes on my feet, load up my sack all day in this heat. I'm picking cotton, I'm sweating. Woo! Picking cotton, I'm sweating. Woo! Picking cotton, I'm sweating. Woo! Massa crack that whip, nigga, 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 is what he called me. But I never knew what a nigga was till I got here. Got here on the boat. Smell of oak and piss packed tight beside Mama Nell, but I didn't know this would be the last time I see Mama Nell called Massa. He got a system. Took mama, took wife, took children, took manhood, took religion. It didn't take long. He showed good at that thing called took. He said, you will be in the field. From sun up to sun down, pick fast, work like a machine. I developed strong wrists and figured took some cuts from dry bristles. That blood drip on that cotton, that red on that white. Looks like peppermint candy, but it was nothing sweet. Ooh. Hate. Screaming its intensity at us like massa. Screaming at us for not picking fast enough, because this ain't for no house, nigga. Serving tea wearing blouse, nigga. Town about you dark skinned, you were dark skinned that you picking. Town about you trying to run, but if you caught, it's a whipping. And I wonder, will I ever see my homeland? The fields there are vast and beautiful. A village nearby. I can see a river. That same river where used to cool our warm bodies. I used to wash my wife's beautiful feet. I used to splash water on my children. I can still hear their laughter. Mama say soon be my turn to be a king. Only to wake up to be a soon to be servant. In a boat. Smell of oak and piss packed tight beside Mama Nim. But I didn't know this would be the last time I see Mama Nim. Because my mama, she gave up her will to live. Took mama, my wife, in chains. Screaming why? Took wife. No, no. Just all our babies. Just all our babies. Took children. Saw some of the strength of the ancestors to break these chains. I started to fight. Witchcraft like lightning. I started to fight. Witchcraft like thunder. I started to fight. Witchcraft like give me your freedom. Nigga took manhood. I'm a used to be man. Hunched over like willows during the winter. I wonder if Massaback hunched over from all the plucking of African people, throw them in a sack called America, throw them in fields vast and beautiful. Slave quarters nearby. I could see a river. There's freedom beyond that river. I will not be a slave in these fields forever. I will find my family even if I have the dead train. And if you don't believe me, just watch. Thank you so much. Mr. Show me so much love. I love the Midwest man. I'm showing you so much love. This up the boy. Thank y'all so much. I am Black.com. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram as I am Blue Black. So hit me up. Please follow me. I do have merchandise. Thank y'all so much. I appreciate the ride. Man, woo! Thank everybody for coming out. 
We appreciate y'all. We enjoyed y'all. We love the energy. Um, y'all want to catch part two? We will be at the hideout this coming Sunday, March 3rd. And the address is 100 East Broadway, Mesega Heights, Michigan, 49444. And um, it's a $5 cover charge, but the inspiration is always free. Only $5? Only, only, only $5. Okay, okay. And the time will be from 7 to 10 p.m. Doors open at 7, show starts at 7.30. Um, I have a sign-up sheet, like, tonight at the door for participation and all that stuff. Um, hey, can I do one more thing? Come on out, yeah. So, everywhere I go, I get a, a, a snapshot, a video of the audience, because I try to see who got the hypest audience. So far, Savannah George is winning, but I want y'all to be, like, real, real loud and make noise, try to show the world. Two, three, follow!